I'm just going to share my screen. Um, just tell me if you can see my screen. It's okay. Okay. Um, second. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, can you can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Let me see. Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay. So I guess we'll get started. Um, I don't want to take too much time because it's the first class. So um, I usually just because I know there's going to be more students that join next next week. So I'll just give you a brief introduction. Yes, sir. Um, about you know what uh grade twelve physics university preparation at Averos Academy is going to look like. So uh, agenda for today, I'm just going to introduce myself, tell me who I like about myself, what I do. Uh, we're going to get into the course overview. So like basically a breakdown of uh, what units we're going to go over um, and then a grade breakdown. So like what you're going to be assigned and then evaluated. And then we'll just get into like lesson zero today, which is like not technically a lesson, but it's still like, I guess you'll see, because like the fact that Anyone that shows up today will get uh, bonus points. So, um, okay. So just a brief introduction of who I am. My name is Christopher Alameo. Um, I'm a University of Toronto graduate uh, in computer science and statistics. So that's a double major. Um, I assume everyone that's joining this class will has ambition to go into university. And, um, you know, I'm just here to guide you guys and help you guys uh, the best way I possibly can. Um, so if you have any questions about university, you know, like, give me a, like, let me know, I can probably answer them. Um, and then I, my hobbies, I enjoy working out, reading, pottage, piano, running. I didn't put uh, walking my dog in there, but if you look to the picture, you'll see uh, that's my dog, Coda. Um, he's a Bernie Shepherd. Um, so it's, the black one, uh, not the brown one. The brown one is his friend, Bernie. Um, interest, um, a, a very interested in space exploration, AI uh, regulation, neuroscience and stocks. So like business and whatnot. Um, I also enjoy like uh, nature and burgers, uh, as you can see is my favorite food. And then cookies is also something I really like to make. Um, my email address is uh, christopher.almail at mail.utoronto.ca. Please direct any, um, you know, if you miss a class or whatever, just direct those to that email. Um, and for emergencies only, if you can't make it or miss a midterm exam or whatever, um, just give me a text, 905-922-0773. Uh, or I think I'm in the WhatsApp, so it's not too much of a problem. Um, okay. Uh, so again, all of these slides will be uh, posted in the Google Classroom. Uh, yes, or if you want, you can probably, um, if you're at your laptop, you can definitely go um, go into uh, the Google settings and then go into the classroom and you'll see I posted these lecture slides there. So, so okay, so course overview. So how this class is going to be structured is there's going to be basically 43 um, classes or total total uh times you'll attend this class um it's going to happen twice a week so monday and wednesday um ideally uh it's going to be 5 to 7 p.m now um obviously today's class will will finish a bit early because um it's just first class so it's nothing too too much to stress about but as we get closer to midterm and final exam that time may get extended because you know students will have questions they want to get it answered and and whatnot so but typically we finish around like 6.30. Um, today we'll probably finish around like six. Um, we'll see. So, uh, okay, so total, so I broke down the total class hours per week is four hours of your lecture time. So every time that you spend in class is counted as, uh, as one hour of lecture. Then what's gonna happen uh, after that is you'll have two, uh, two tutorials. Um, well, sorry, sorry, not two tutorials. You'll have an assignment uh, that you have to complete uh, every two weeks. So it's a biweekly assignment. Now, I two hours is what I would at most assume you guys take to finish the, the assignments. But honestly, if you guys just pay attention in class and like get it, uh, get it like pay attention in class, the questions are very similar. So you shouldn't have a problem there. 
Um, so yeah, uh, the, the way I structure my classes is that I'll talk for an hour. I don't really like to talk too, too long. Cause I know it's, uh, my voice can get boring at times. So I, I like to keep it a little bit short then, uh, so five to six would be the time I present the topics, explain the lecture, go through the slides and basically walk you through what we're learning today. Then the next hour you're going to be spending practicing. So these questions that I present during class, you can, um, it's basically like an independent work period, but uh, you can have time to ask questions if you need help or get stuck on a question, just um, either raise your hand or just, I can take you into like a virtual room and we can go over um, on the whiteboard, what uh, problem you're stuck on. Um, I put a note there that, yeah, you probably want to use this practice time during class because I'll let you complete your assignment as well. So during this uh, class time. So um, I believe if you click on that link, it will open up into a spreadsheet. And um, I think, wait, let me just check who joined. I think there's students. Okay. So it's just, uh, okay. Yes, yeah, sir. So if you if you click into that uh, link, yes, yeah, sir. What you what you'll see is a. Oh, one second, one second. Sorry. Let me flip back. So uh, what you'll see is a spreadsheet. Now, what I want you to do, yes, sir, in that spreadsheet. Don't do it right now. Do it after class or when we finish. Um, basically, what what you're gonna do want to do is uh, type in your name. So this will be your first assignment. It's worth. I'll give you one uh, percent. Uh, towards it and then a bonus mark as well so just write your name uh write your a full name first and last um your uh general interests like what what are your interests outside of school or outside of like you know yes yeah, school like hobbies and then like what program you're trying to pursue in, into university if, if you want to share that if not that's okay but just just to get an idea of like okay my my students and like what they what they're interested in, what they're not interested in and whatnot so um, so if, yeah, I believe if you click into that link, it'll open a spreadsheet. So, um, take your time for that. Don't, don't rush. You don't have to do it right now. You can do it, uh, after class. Okay. So breakdown. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, there's going to be, so your total grade is going to be a hundred percent. Uh, you'll have that hundred percent broken down into three categories. So you'll have assignments that is worth 20%, uh, total of 22 assignments. So it's every, again, like I said, it's bi-weekly. So next week will be your first assignment, um, not this week. So, and then you'll have a midterm consisting of 30% and a final exam consisting of 40%. Now there is a chance you can get, if you, uh, in-class participation. So, you know, if I ask a question and if you like unmute yourself or if you post in the chat, I consider that as in-class participation. Uh, for the attendance, uh, again, it's pretty straightforward. If you attend class, you get the full 5%. If you miss, uh, I think if you miss five classes in a row, you don't get the 5%. So you can skip one or two or three. I don't mind that. But if you miss a total of five in this semester, you won't get the 5%. Uh, and yeah, so again, if you complete both, you get perfect attendance score and then, you know, you're participating in class. But it kind of works hand in hand, you know, if you attend in person or if you attend online, you're going to get the in-class participation. So you'll get a 10% a completion if you if you do that both. Um, again, and that, that that link that you click into, yes, or, or anyone watching virtually is essentially uh, the link to the attendance sheet. So I'll start taking attendance like next week. No, no rush for now. Okay. Assignments. So assignments, like I said, released every second week on Monday during class. So I'll release it like uh, before class um, and it'll be due Wednesday that same week uh, after class. So 7 p.m. Uh, there is a late submission policy, unfortunately. So there's a deduction of 10 percent for every uh, hour you submit a late until the assignments were at zero percent. Um. So yeah, just submit it on time and, you know, we won't have any problems. You know, if there's obviously a reasonable excuse, reasonable, you know, not excuse, but, you know, if there's a reason why you couldn't submit it, then that's okay. Like I'll, I'll consider it, but just at the end of the day, just submit stuff on time because it's not only me, that's going to be like on your back to get this stuff done, but it's going to be like the university. And when you have like the pressures of like six, seven classes at one time, you just, honestly, you just want to get it done and over with and submit it. You don't want to, have to be in the situation where you're 
procrastinate and then you have like four, five assignments due that same day. And then, you know, you have the capacity to do it, but you just don't have the time to do it. So you, you unfortunately just skip it or whatever. So, yeah, so we, we just, I put that in place on uh, just to make sure you guys keep on, keep on par with everything. And, you know, it is university level class. So just, you know, just be ready for what you guys will expect this time next year. Right. Cause if you think about it, like, yeah, this time you're this time this year, you're in high school, but this time next year, you're going to be like first year university. Like, so it's, uh, time goes by quick. So midterm, uh, the date will be to do, uh, to be determined. So I'll definitely post it on the Google classroom, uh, for you guys to, for you guys will be well, well advanced, like two, three weeks in advance. I'll, I'll definitely post the date. Um, I know for sure it's going to cover units one to three. Um, pretty straightforward midterm, 30 multiple choice. So it's going to be one bonus. Um, each question is worth about 1%. You can, you can plan for that. So, um, yeah, if you, if you don't like multiple choice, I strongly suggest you guys get really good at it because honestly, that's going to be the life of your first and second year. Cause there's just too many there. A, there's too many students B there's just too many uh, questions to be graded like by hand. So they just submit it through Scantron. So I personally don't like multiple choice. And like only when I got into my third and fourth year, did they, the pr professors ease up on that. And they actually did like word problems and like written out like handwritten ones where the pro where, you know, the prof is going to read it and not some like bot or like some machine. Anyways, um, okay, final exam, same thing, uh, dates to be determined. The format of this one, I know it's going to be 20 multiple choice and 20 short answer questions. Um, pretty straightforward, pretty standard uh, also in the like university, but I think they do definitely more multiple choice. I'm being a little bit more lenient because like it's worth 40% of your grade, so I want you guys to do like really well. Um, and then again, each question is worth approximately 1%. Okay, so breakdown of course units, what we're going to go over is unit one is going to cover our kinematics. Unit two, we're going to transition into Newton's laws. It's pretty, it's pretty good because like you understand that like a lot of the concepts are, um, they're, they're parallel in, in one, one aspect, but they also, um, they're relatable. So like they're, they, you know, you, you won't be relearning, you won't be learning new, new topics. You'll be almost like transferring skills. Then unit three, unfortunately, is electricity, which is like a, I, I think it's probably a very uh, different unit, but same, uh, same concepts kind of transfer. Sound is very much different as well. So there's nothing to transfer between sound and electricity. Uh, work and dynamic, oh, sorry, unit five will finish off with work and dynamic, pretty, pretty easy and light, light finish. So I, I caution against it because unit, like students go breeze through unit one and unit two, then they get like, absolutely demolished on unit three and four so i just recommend just pacing yourself the difficulty doesn't change it's honestly just the work ethic like if you start off with something easy you're obviously not going to be prepared for something very difficult in the near future but again like that's just a curveball that a lot of first year students go through where you know they expect it to be very easy and it's very it is very easy in the first uh semester but then when winter rolls around and that's their second semester. So it's basically part two of everything they learned in fall. They, they absolutely just, just, they don't do well at all. And it's like, because they just didn't prepare well enough in first semester to retain enough of the info to be like, okay, I'm going to keep this info in the back of my mind, but it's okay. You guys, I guess you'll learn through um, more and more practice, but. Okay, so <clears throat> I guess we can start with lesson zero. Um, let me see if anyone else joined in a second. Um, okay, so it's still me and Yasser. Okay, Yasser. Um, I think it's just going to be us for the rest of the class, which is okay. Um, I think the other students will definitely join later, uh, later in the week. Okay, so let's start. So basically, uh, there's an important distinction to make between cause and effect when analyzing the motion of objects. So what we what we want to ask ourselves is two like very separate questions. So the first question is like, how does a particle, um, how does a particular object move? Like, you know, like if you look outside or if you look at like 
every anything around you like something's always moving but like you gotta understand like, i think this is purely a descriptive like geometrical question that, that we're asking like like what does and essentially what, what i'm trying to say is like what does the geometry of that motion look like like if we know that an object's moving okay it's definitely have some kind of uh, uh motion where we can where we can describe it through vectors and scalars so my whole thing is that if, if we were to draw a trajectory as like a function of time, what what's the shape of that trajectory, right? Or if we say like, like, you know, like essentially what I'm trying to ask is like, what does geometry of motion look like? So basically the study of geometry of motion for the trajectory is referred to as kinematics. Like that's what we're studying. That's what we're getting to know. The second question we got to ask ourselves is why does the object move the way it does? You know, and then they, these are questions I don't think a lot of people ask, but these are questions I ask, you know, and uh, like to get me curious on like, okay, what are these formulas that I'm going to eventually be using? Like, how, how are they applicable? Like, I'm, for me, it's very visual, but, you know, um, I guess it changes from person to person. But so, yeah, so the second question we asked ourselves was, why does an object move the way it does? And, you know, why does the kinematic description of the trajectory look the way it does? Um, and so like th this concerns, uh, like basically what the causes are of the motion and the changes in that motion that, you know, so, um, and, and, and that leads us directly right into like the changes of motion is what's called dynamics. Like that's the study of, uh, that's, that is dynamics, like the study that causes the changes, uh, behind these, these different motions. And so. Now I won't get into too much, like, but Newton's second law uh, connects basically these two, these two equations, um, or sorry, these two questions, right? So on the slides, we have F equals MA, right? But I'm not just telling you to solve, like, I know like standard grade 11 was just like, oh, solve for M or solve for A. But what I'm trying to build is like an intuitive sense. Like, so when we write F equals MA, this is basically a mathematical identity. And like, what what we're trying to say is that we're connecting two different questions. So if we uh if we basically imagine the middle being divided into the left side and the right side, what we see is basically the right side, the MA side, is essentially asking the question, how does the object move? Right? And like what does the motion look like? While like the the F basically symbolizes um the 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 force that's um that that are basically acting on that on that object. So and I'll and I'll repeat myself again. So like the left hand side of the equation where the forces are, um, this answers the question of why. Like why does the object move the way it does? Like what causes the motion of change? And again, like these are different conceptually. Like like when you, when we imagine them, they're they're very different. So um so yeah, so I, I mean to build it and i guess you guys can think about it some more but yeah that like an intuitive sense like why does objects move the way they do and like what causes the object to move if you start with those questions it's like kinematics will be very easy okay so i guess we can start with like what is physics so because kinematics is just a, a subtopic of physics but it's not really all physics right so physics basically is the study of the physical world. Like we look around, like everything you look around is um, has some relation to physics. And it's, I guess you can say it is because of gravity because nothing can operate without gravity, right? Like our, our, our like um, when I say like from watches to machinery, like everything is controlled by uh, gravity. So, um, you know, you know, we we can make obviously great predictions um, on a broad range of phenomena that you know you can we can understand from, but you know physics is 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 very very important when you look around in the real world, and um, you know it's more than just solving solving equations and solving complex problems, but yeah. So okay, so for example, I mean this car is presented on the screen. Uh, a lot of of like a lot of these cars will have um like a, a lot of different um 
basically like different parts of it, moving parts that still contribute to um, physics, right? So let's see. So for example, um, electromagnetism, uh, you would definitely need it for a battery starter or battery starter and headlights, like every electrical component in your car definitely needs some kind of um, electrical component. The thermodynamics part of a vehicle, you're looking at the hydraulics, um, internal combustion of like the gases and uh, whatnot to make your vehicle move in a forward direction. I, uh, obviously, I think they're missing. Oh, mechanics. So the hydraulics of it, motion, spinning wheels, friction and traction, optics, headlights, rear view mirrors and, and whatnot. So looking at a car now, you, you would appreciate it a lot because it's more than just a piece of metal on wheels. It's a, what we like to say, it's a physics phenomenon. Why is because you just have so many moving parts that all synchron, like they all synchronize to work in unison together. But if you think about it, they're not really alive, but yet they're still communicating. And that's like, I guess you can say that's the art of uh, calculus, but it's the art of physics where everything just combines together in a, almost like, almost like a, a, a celestial mix. Like, you know, when you look out into space and you see all these like different, um, you know, like you see these different uh, stars and planets collide and then, you know, but um, yeah. So, oh, and then just vibrations, mechanical waves and stuff like that. Okay. So yeah, this is uh physics everywhere. Um, I think, okay, what did I, so when you buy ice cream, why do you put it in the freezer when you get home? So, yeah. So again, temperature, I guess it's pretty relevant today. It's very hot outside. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm just in my, uh, condo here, downtown Toronto, just looking outside. So yeah, it's very hot. I see a lot of people wearing, you know, t-shirts, sunglasses, and head, 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 head caps. So, but all that revolves around temperature, right? Like people wouldn't be doing that if we're wearing t-shirts or whatever, or like sunglasses if it wasn't 33 degrees, right? Or they wouldn't be sweating or, or whatnot. So, okay. Um, yeah, so again, this is just, uh, these are just slides that you, I want you to uh, consider because again, multiple choice questions are very easy. Like uh, for these ones, I'd just be like, it would, would be like a true and false would, would these three um be considered a a physics phenomenon or not so i usually take questions directly from the slide so like yeah it wouldn't be anything new you would see um okay um oh sailboats okay so sailboats oh one sec wait oh wait 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 uh, okay sorry so sailboats so um again uh, it's just it's just another example to show how physics really helped uh move our i guess you can say our civilization forward because like for a sailboat to be designed like you have to take into account a lot of factors um and a lot of those factors have to depend on one one another but if one of the factors basically does not work, um, you're going to be looking at um, systems and defaults in place that basically make up for um, for the missing part or, or the broken part. And this sailboats is just one example. I could have used airplanes as a great example for physics where you basically constructed a finished product. But like if you ever looked into uh, a pilot's um, sitting position, you'll see all these buttons in his in his um, in his area. And those are basically defaults in the computer system that are subject to uh, failure or pass. Like there's very just two. It's very binary. So and physics really helps um, consolidate that. Uh, so um, sailboats is just one example. So I should have put airplanes, but. Anyways, what so now what we're going to get into is basically the scientific method. So what basically we, we, what we want to do is always experiment with topics, but approach it from a very not analytical perspective, because if you're too analytical, you, you block out the you block out certain opportunities. So the scientific method is basically a method where you gather all the information and you put it into a very sequential step. 
process. So that then that and in that stages, what people fail to realize is that that is the experiment itself. Like the scientific method is your lab. Like it, it is the only method we know till date that has proven proven positive experiments and the best likely outcomes. Like every experiment that we followed through in science that went through the scientific method has built like stuff that you probably don't even imagine. Like you see like the F-16 like fighter jets or whatever, like you probably heard of like the war in Ukraine or whatever. But like right now we're producing some of the best military equipment only because we followed through this scientific method. So um, yeah, it works in healthcare, it works in air defense, everything. So, um, so what we, so yeah, so basically it can be summarized in these four stages, right? So when we make an observation, um, on anything like, and that's just, that's the original stages, right? So you make an observation that could be asking a question that could be, you know, gathering, you know, gather insight or, or, or you, you, you. I guess you can say you can interpret like this would be the interpretation stage. Then once you have the interpretation set, like you have the canvas set, essentially, you want to start collecting data that leads back to your question. Like you want to start collecting more and more insight, like through different resources on like, OK, am I proving this question to be right or wrong? Right. Like and that's where bias comes in. And that's I think bias is very is very interesting, too. And I can probably go on for like hours on bias. But um yeah, it's like you want to you want to minimize bias by collecting the most factual data that doesn't change your question, because the moment you change your question on the data, the certain type of data you collected, well, it's not really what you started off with. And that that's a problem. So. Um, so, yeah, so stick to your original question and then collect data. Then once you have that, you want to formulate and start testing your hypothesis against that question. You want to start reinforcing whether what you set out was either true or false once you have that set which is like probably the most important two stages then the easy stages happen at the end where you're just interpreting your final uh observations and concluding whether you know whether this journey was successful or not or whether you know what you sought out was true or not um so yeah uh that's the scientific method i so we'll throughout this course we'll definitely be doing a couple of labs that deal with um that deal with a lot of uh exploration you know what i mean so it, it'll be i want i i really hope we can do this experiment where um you know you can actually go outside and collect air temperature data like from your own uh from your own uh iphone and then hopefully we can trans just to see i'm very interested in variance in data i think like when you have a bunch of uh, numbers correlated, but from different sources, there always seems no matter how, like, and this is true, and this has been true for like centuries, like I think over like 100 decades at this at this point, ever since numbers existed, kind of, but like, you can have a like, you can have a 100 of the same iPhones kind of collecting the same data, like same information. But at the end of the day, like when you combine all that information you're going to see variance meaning that you're going to see each iphone like there will be iphones that probably produce the same value and will give you like one or two of the same like values but there's going to be like till decimal points there's going to be like some and that's where the variance happens like there's some different factor um and i don't know i just find it really cool so um hopefully we can do that experiment um soon or like throughout the throughout the semester so uh here's an example of like the scientific method in in, in real life uh i think cops use it sorry i don't think cops use it at every single crash crash sorry crash site or like uh speeding pullover or whatever like if a law enforcement pulls you over they are conducting the scientific method right and that's why they always win right because people a don't know how to handle themselves and when they're presented with like if they're presented with information that kind of makes them uh how do i say it? like insecure they're gonna get or they know it's true they're gonna they're gonna always like default to like the worst possible option and that's like lying or running away or whatever right so anyway so 
Uh, so there's a car accident the police were investigating and now they can use like the scientific method, right? So a cop shows up on scene. He's going to observe. He's going to be like, okay, what happened? Pull out his notepad, start documenting, writing some data. Next, he's going to develop an hypothesis because he wasn't there, right? He wasn't at the crash site. So he has to start, he has to start being a very smart detective. So he has to be like, okay, if I wasn't at the job site, right? And I didn't know. Or sorry, not job site. If I wasn't at the site of the crash and I basically didn't know what was happening, like how would you like how would you interpret what like what's right or what's wrong? Like how would we know that this crash didn't happen because um you know he was driving impaired or whatever? So essentially he has to create a, an hypothesis. Then he'll start taking out tests, he'll start doing like, you know, breathalyzer and all that type of stuff, right? Um, once he has all of that, let's say now he's gathered enough information to conclude, okay, this person was driving, but there wasn't essentially enough evidence in the blood alcohol to test, uh, not enough, uh, information in the blood alcohol to conclude that this person was impaired because there was just not enough data in there. Okay. So then he concludes that the person was not impaired and then the, the person just probably fell asleep on, on the wheel and then what, whatever happened, happened after that. So, and then after that, then we'll build the conclusion and go and go from there. So, um, so essentially every cop that you see on the, on the, on the road right now is following the scientific method. Like they have no other, other alternative, like they can't. And that's, I guess, I guess you can say it's, it's, it's a law that was built in, but aside from that, that's, that's, that's a bit, I, I really like that example because essentially like you, you showcase that, um, you know, there is systems and pro uh, pro processes that everyone should follow um and you know just uh just go by that so what we're going to see right now is is a bunch of models so we have a person uh shooting a basketball now if you shoot a basketball what you're going to look at is is it just a, a straight projectile motion and um I, I i believe models really help in uh demonstrating basically what we're looking at and what what data like you're, you're visualizing the data so basically you you have all of this info like even from the that diagram by by itself of the guy just shooting a basketball that tells us enough on okay this situation circumstance basically it answers three of the 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 five questions in the scientific method right so and i guess i'll, I'll get a little sidetracked here but like sports scientists and people like sports physicians, like physicians just means like you have physics. But anyways, that's like it's kind of like a weird word on play. But essentially what, what you want to do with so what sports physicians do when they're analyzing sports athletes that make like hundreds of millions of dollars every year, what they're trying to do is prevent injury. Like that's like that in itself is a very like it's a very popular business and it's a very um it's a very lucrative business. Why is because if you have a sports physician that understands physics very well, and he understands like the human body, what, essentially the human anatomy very well. So he's essentially going to keep your team from getting less injured throughout the throughout the season. And you'll have your players more healthier and more playing time, which eventually translates into you like the team winning like an NBA championship or, or, like a, a very like you know prestigious medal or whatnot, right? Because you kept your players healthy. Now, from that diagram, what sports scientists actually can do is they'll model that whole human being, everything from like the moment his fingertips left the ball, right down to his toes striking or leaving the ground. What that does, it they can now from that just from that that those two observations, what they can calculate is the amount of force that's that athlete exerted off the ground to jump at that certain level. And then they can also calculate like the mobility of that athlete's shoulder strength, elbow strength, wrist strength, everything um, just from those two uh, observations. And then they translate, translate it right back into a model version. So models are very efficient in demonstrating um, a lot of like flaws in the system and they can actually help you solve problems a lot quicker. So again, uh, this slide is just a continuation of what we uh, talked about. So you have an observation, the balls, uh, and now, now you're just observing, right? So you're still following the scientific method, 
but we're getting more and more granular. So we're understanding, okay, what is the ball size? Like how is the spin, weight, color, all of that stuff. So, and then you obviously go, go into more detail so you can figure out, okay, when the like surroundings were at that air quality temperature, what kind of, how did that impact the force of the ball or how did it impact the speed of the ball? Um, and then we can uh, evaluate more from there. So, okay. So what we have, okay. So this is, this is very interesting because if you look at how we build our hypotheses, what we want to see is essentially a reinforcement to I'd like to to basically agree or disagree if our hypothesis was true or not, right? So, but we can't just do it off data alone. I believe we actually need to have a solid model to uh, to evaluate it. So, the best example I could give is probably Galileo Galilei by his um, basically his uh, ramp experiment. So, what he tested was. You have you're rolling down uh, a ball off a ramp onto another ramp, which is equal in size and equal in height. Now, will that ball reach the same point at which it was dropped? Now, a lot of people think that it, it's not true, like they won't, but it's completely false. And that that ball that was originally dropped from an uh, from an original standpoint will eventually land into the same spot it was dropped. Um, and why is this? Is because essentially you have um, his theory of conservation of energy where, um, you know, mass cannot be created or destroyed, can just be transferred. So when you have energy that gets transferred from one object onto another, but everything is equal and you hold every all the variables the same, there's nothing that gets, um, I guess you can say wasted, but uh, we can, uh, we'll, we'll evaluate that when as the classes go deeper into friction and, and work and whatnot, so. Okay, um, hypothesis to prediction. So until the invention of the air pump, for example, it was impossible to perform direct tests in the absence of air resistance. So when you think about that, now we can talk about air resistance as in like, okay, like we, 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 we built chambers that have, it's essentially a vacuum, right? There's no air, right? Like that's what a vacuum is. Like there's no air inside, but you're pump, like you're basically pumping air like you're suck, like you're, uh, like you're, yeah, basically sucking in air, and then you're holding it in that vacuum space. But there's no air in there to begin with, right? So, um, how we can make the so what I'm trying to lead us into is essentially significant digits, right? And that's where our, um, and that's where I guess you can say our most, uh, yeah, numbers of measurement. That's we can say our most errors occur is where we have less more more significant digits than what we what we anticipated right and that's like if you look in our data like all of our digits right now are, are skewed like and this is and this is across every industry like we're looking at healthcare aviation uh military uh airspace defense like we're having a huge number number problem and you know, I, I think it's it's translating a lot into our currency and, and where we're stand like where we're standing on society today. But um because of these um variants in numbers, we're we're experiencing a lot of a lot of difficulty. So um in in this uh during this semester, what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover um basically force, velocity, energy, volume, and acceleration. Now all of these topics have the same um, if not very similar um, numbers of measurement, aka significant digits that they must be rounded to. So, for example, uh, force of gravity is nine point eight one. Uh, it depends on the direction, but if you're pointing downwards, it's positive. If you're if you're pointing upwards, it's going to be negative. Um, I think acceleration uh, from the moon is around three point zero times ten to the eight. Um, kilometers per second um so essentially there's there's going to be standard units where you're going to be uh asked to follow and that's for, for very like uh specific reasons because we want our data to match um what we're giving it right so we want to essentially the, the think about the think about when you have an equation right you're going to be computing or you're going to be inputting some numbers now those numbers you want to make sure that they they're rounded not only to the same um, decimal point 
as the data in the question. And that that's because there, there'll be no variance, right? The variance happens when students start rounding numbers and they, they get lost and, oh, I got to go to three, four decimal. No, just keep it. If there's two decimal points in the question, just keep your final answer around it to do two decimal points. Like it's um it's pretty straightforward, but uh yeah, the variance in the numbers is what uh gets a lot of students. So again, we have a standard uh index or standard unit of measurement. Um it's gonna be pretty straightforward. We'll have lengths in meters, mass in grams, times in seconds. Um other units derived, basically just go to the three bases uh, for decimal points, um, pretty straightforward. Now, I'm going to ask a question of the class to make sure everyone's on point. Um, and again, I can't, uh, I can't hear your audio, so you, what you want to do is just raise your hand. So, hi, Laureen, and hi, Yasser. So, just... Hi. Uh, Hi guys, sorry, I, I, I didn't see Lorene. Uh sorry to um I just started I had to start the class a little bit early, but we'll finish around uh I think it's five forty five right now, so we'll finish around like six ten. Does anyone ha have any questions so far though? Or no, no questions. No questions? Okay. Okay. Um okay. Okay, great. Uh L Loreen, uh did you were you here for the first part where I explained like attendance grade breakdown or I I think the slides are posted in the Google Classroom. Yeah, I joined like 10 minutes late only. Oh, okay. So you, you saw the introduction. You didn't miss it. Yeah, anything. yeah, I did. Okay, good. Okay. 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 Um, okay. Um, okay. So yeah, like I said, um, there's going to be a wide range of uh, measurements that we're going to be use, using throughout this semester. Um, I was like, dealing with powers of 10 um, just because it's easier and it looks nicer and neater on the paper. Um, so this slide, I believe, oh, it's just um, making sure we're all on the same symbols like mega for big M, kilo, uh, deca, centa, milla, micro, nano, and pico. Um, I will never use pico, nano, Micro, I may use millimeters, highly, un actually millimeters, I'll use, um, the standard is usually centimeters, kilos, and that's about it. So I'll, I'll keep it to that. Um, I'm not trying to throw you guys unnecessary curveballs like that don't make sense. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it won't, it won't be that. The conversion, the converting numbers won't be that big of a uh, problem. Um, okay. One sec. Uh, okay, so dimensional analysis. So what we're doing, okay, so what we're seeing here is essentially like, it's almost like that math problem that kind of stumps a lot of people, but it's, it's like saying, if I have five oranges and there's um, 10 people, you know, it, 10, and if I have five oranges and there's 10 friends, how many ways can I split the oranges equally so that each friend gets an orange, right? A p or a piece of an orange, right? And so like those numbers are easy, but essentially it's like the crisscross method, right? So you'll have like two variables, like you'll you'll split the page into like left side, right side. You'll have, okay, five on the left side, have five oranges. So you have oranges and people. You'll have five oranges on the left side and then you'll have 10 people on the right side. Then right below the five, you're going to put like a question mark because you don't know how many oranges um, are needed, but then you know it's got to get divided through 10 people. So it's like the crisscross method. Um, it's basically just dividing. Um, um, so I, the first question, I guess you guys can copy it down. And uh, I want, I guess I, I would like a, a written solution uh, to be submitted if you guys could. Um, uh, so a typical bacterium has a mass of about two micrograms. So just express this in terms of grams and kilograms. So it's it's based it's pretty pretty straightforward. But um, I'll give you guys like five minutes to solve it, and then let me know what what answer you guys get.
Okay. So did you guys uh, find the answer or not yet? Or you guys need some more time? Essentially, what you want to do is you have two micrograms of this certain bacterium. And essentially, if it's going to get, if you're, if you know your final answer is in grams or kilograms, you just want to multiply that by, um, or sorry, you just want to divide that by 100 and divide that by 1,000. Because there's, for every one microgram, there's going to be 100, uh, sorry, for every one gram, there's going to be 100 micrograms. And for every one microgram, there's going to be a thousand. Sorry, sorry, sorry. For every a uh, hundred grams, no, what am I? Saying? For every, sorry, one microgram is equivalent to zero point zero zero one gram, which is essentially just one divided by hundred. Sorry, zero point zero one, and then there's a thousand mic micro micro kilograms in one kilogram. If that makes sense. And there's a hundred, yeah, there's a hundred micrograms in one gram. There, that, that's what I was trying to get. Okay. Um problem. Mm, the boss the average person expressed. Okay, that's fine. Oh these questions again, I'll let you I'll let you tackle them after class. But yeah, like these are the questions I'd probably put on your midterm, like just straight from this lecture note. Um, I won't actually give you guys the answer. I'm going to expect you guys to solve it. If you want to know the answer, my email, again, is free. Uh, just send me a copy of the solution, and I'll tell you if it's right or wrong. Um, dimensions and units must agree. So this is, again, I'm not going to worry about it because I think you guys would understand. Like, you're not going to name your final answer. I, they will be, like, you will get marks deducted, unfortunately, but... Um, uh, like in, in university, like let's say your final answer was supposed to be in kilograms and you wrote grams, like you will get like two or three marks deducted. I know it's like a lot, but they're very like, they're very like, they're very, I don't know, like they're very like weird about units and they're like, see, like you can have every stage, right? But if your units is not right at the end, like they'll, you're losing like three marks and if there's a total of five marks, like you're only going to get two on five. So yeah, just make sure your units are right. And it's like, I don't know why, but I think it was mainly because like they want to see you paying attention, I guess, or something. I don't know. I, but yeah, unfortunately, I'll have to deduct marks if the units aren't the same. Um, accuracy and precision. Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, we won't do actual labs. So we won't, we're not going to worry about this stuff. Um, but yeah, this is just experiments and whatnot. Um, okay, so this is pretty important when it comes to errors in your experiment. So there will be a virtual lab, um, and there will be like all the data will be there for you to, you know, uh, use and whatnot. However, there's going to be, and this is like built into it, it's going to be, um, basically subject to, um, you making an error and catching that error so the moment you can catch that error then that's what, like the the whole point of the lab and you'll see what i'm talking about soon because like when you're doing a lab and you're going through the motions of like okay i'm collecting this sample or i'm recording this piece of data and you're doing it for like hundreds and hundreds of rows and columns you, you're gonna you're gonna see oh crap i think i missed um, I think I missed one. That's why my numbers aren't really adding up to the computer, right? They're not adding up to this. And that's that's the, the nature of the experiment, just to see if you can really pay attention to detail uh, and follow through the steps, no matter how repetitive or how boring it gets. Um, so, but when, when, when you do encounter an error, uh, it'll be interesting to see what you guys do. Uh, I think a lot of students just continue pressing on some students will put like uh, a red note saying, hey, I think something's weird here, but I continue to press on. Uh, best students, I think, are the ones that are willing to say, oh, I messed up on row 110 and now I have to start again on from row zero. Um, what's interesting is that do you throw away that data or do you keep that data? Um, and again, that's the question I'm not going to, 
I'm not gonna have to. I'm not gonna answer because it's it's part of the lab where you'll during your observations you'll you'll have to make that choice and see if it, it was a good choice or not good choice. So, just something to think about, right? Like, it's almost like th think about it like this, right? Like, if you make if you make a cookie dough, right? Or if you if you, let's say you want to make cookies, right? So you start you're making the cookie dough. You, you know, you're mixing the flour, you're mixing the butter, you're mixing the egg, but then you you're like, wait a second, you know. I don't think I'm, I measured this right, or I don't think like something doesn't look right here. Would you would you throw out that cookie cookie batter? You know, like and that, again, that, that, that's just the way I kind of think of things. My answer would be no. Like, you don't want to throw away that cookie batter, and neither do you want to throw away that data because guess what? Data is important. Whether it's you know whether you did it wrong or whether you you know you didn't follow the steps, you, you still recorded something. Like some there was some event that happened that took place where. You followed through a bunch of steps and then you were able to uh, effectively um, produce an outcome. And I think that outcome is most important when it comes to um, basically figuring out uh, hypotheses and figuring out uh, your, you know, your your whole scientific method. So, um, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, precision is going to be, uh, again, we'll, we'll figure that out later, uh, later. Um, Again, significant figures, like I said before, it's, it's um, you know, here are just some examples of what happens when you don't uh, do significant figures right or sig figs. Um, okay, yeah, so so again, these significant figure problems, I'm going to post, uh, they're, they're attached to the slides, so I'm going to probably, um, uh, if you, if you want to complete them, by all means, complete them, but yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's always a highly... Uh, highly chance that I use these same questions on the midterm and final. So um, best just to get it over with, keep them, keep them in your notes. So that way final exam or midterm rolls around, like you're, you won't see any, any new questions. Like there's no, no surprises essentially. Cause I don't like, no offense. I don't like surprises at all. So I, uh, I don't, I don't give surprises to students and I don't give, um, I don't, I don't just, I, I don't give surprise. Like, there's no time in, in this course where if there is, if you if you guys do find a question where you've never seen it, like I've never even discussed about it. And like I brought it up where I even like put it on a final or midterm and you bring it to my attention. I'll probably. I'll probably I, 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 I could probably I, I would probably give you 100 percent. I'd probably give you 100 percent. And you honestly, you wouldn't, you know, but the, the chance of that happening is very unlikely. So but hey, if you find it. You know, I guess you get a hundred percent, but if not, that's okay. Um, just so we we have it on paper, rounding. I, like I said before, I want three significant figures at most. If I see four, I'm probably gonna get mad, a little bit mad. But again, I'll I'll probably I won't deduct marks. I'll never deduct marks for more significant. But I'll always just question. I'm like, why? Like, you know, why do we need that four? Why do we need the fifth? Like. The more it's doing, it's really causing variance, and that's uh, an annoyance, right? Like we don't need any more variance or noise in the data. Um, so just please stick it to two, maximum three. Um, but yeah, so uh, again, some more significant problems. Uh, there's some practice problems for you guys to do. I I would never put actually wait. Oh, this is grams and milliliters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would put the yeah. These questions are standard. Um, you'll see that you have grams per milliliter, so you're gonna have to do some um, conversion there. Uh, but if you need help on that question, just let me know. I can get. I'll help you guys out. Okay. Uh, language of physics. Hold on. Let me just see how much more slides we have left. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, I guess we can go for this. Okay, then we'll call it a call it a day after this. Um actually uh okay. actually no no no. You know what? If uh, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that cuz usually uh, I'll give um if we if we ran the full 2 hours, I would give you guys like a 10 minute break. Um but since we're ending class today at 6:30, I'll just uh I'll just continue pressing on and we'll uh and we'll I'll I'll leave I'll 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 open the uh floor to questions around like 620 or whatnot. Okay, so 
the language of physics. So this is, I, I, I guess I, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I guess I'm a little bit excessive on language on the choice of words here, but there is, there is like, when you're talking about physics, like there is a different language to it, right? Like there is like, we are speaking a different language here. Like we're not like, you know what I mean? Like we're not, and that, and that that's the language of mathematics, right? I'm not talking about, Oh, like we're, list, we're, we're, we're inventing a new language or like, or, you know, we're dancing around a, a, a fire singing Kumbaya and we're, you know, we're, we're, creating this no i i'm what i'm talking about is basically when you talk when you're in physics or physics class like think about it like math like we're we're, we're you know we have these new topics and ideas and then we essentially create abbreviations for them so like um obviously i'm giving the most standard example gravity like we, in every in every um i guess you can say in every dialect people are going to say gravity as gravity right g-r-a-d-i-t-y but in physics we just denote it as g right and that's that's pretty interesting right because if you see just the letter g on a piece of paper you're not going to know it relates to gravity unless you're in physics class right so that's that's what we're always trying to get to where we're saying like our notations and abbreviations throughout this semester is going to be a different language and um you know my, my whole goal is to try and um, get you familiarized with this language and hopefully uh, get you on your way with solving, you know, from the simplest to the most complex problems. Um, Cause you're going to see symbols in some of the easiest questions and you're going to see symbols in some of the most difficult questions that you encounter. But if you follow the same scientific method on, okay, observing, collecting data, creating a hypothesis, um, re, uh, you know, testing your hypothesis, creating an observation, writing a conclusion, um, that whole stage can really take you to solving some of the most complex problems, not only in physics, but in life in general. And like any other topic you or any other discipline that you want to go to, chemistry, bio, um, and uh, calculus or mathematics, like they're all stem from that one uh, scientific method way. So, um, yeah. So, for example, what we see right here, mathematics and physics, it's a crossover, right? So, we have distance and time. So what you're mimicking right now is essentially the moment that golf ball was struck from uh, from the time it was put on that tee, right? So you're going to see it's going to travel a distance and that distance makes sense, right? Like it, it makes sense why that chart is trending upwards because essentially that golf ball is going to get moved, right? It's going to, from its original position to where it lands, it's going to be further away than where it started. So for that graph to move upwards in that direction, it makes sense. And why is that? It's because we can calculate the area underneath that curve, right? That proves to us that, okay, that ball did travel. It's not just we labeled an X and Y axis and then we are like, oh, just draw a straight line pointing upwards. And that, that essentially tells us that the ball moved forward. No, what we can calculate is the area underneath that curve that, that ball takes to go from point A to point B. And in that time, it traveled a total of, um, it would be uh, 80, it traveled highest and then dropped to 40. So total distance traveled would be 80 and then that that 40, so 120. Um, so, um, so that's just, you know, the crossover between math and physics and, you know, what graphs can tell us between uh, Two, two relational variables, which is, in this case, time and distance. Um, okay. So, yeah, like uh, like I said in the previous slide, graphs are a very useful tool. Uh, you're going to be using them a lot uh, throughout the semester and uh, maybe in your also in your other classes, but graphs are very, very um, important. And here are just some questions related to that graph. Um, again, if you want to solve it, Highly recommend you solve it, submit the answer to me, and then I'll uh, advise if that's right or wrong. And again, I, I won't just say if it's right or wrong. Like, I'll provide the solution as well. So, um, okay. Uh, equations. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, again, throughout the semester, what you're going to see is a lot of equations. And I'm, I'm not, again, the point of this first class is it's called lesson zero for a reason because my whole thing is to kind of 
give you guys some more insight on how to think about things. Like not just, okay, I'm given this equation. Let me go plug in some numbers and calculate an output and then write a therefore statement. Like, no, no, no. I want to see, I want to like, like build some intuition. Like, okay, like why is there an equal sign right in the middle of that equation? Like why are there four or five variables on one side and like two or three on, on one side? Like, like where is this relationship happening, right? So, and that's, that's what's key when, when you look at equations. It's not just, plug in and solve and go from there no like figure out okay what does this equation actually mean and what are we like what are we trying to solve like what are we not trying to solve here but like what does it model like what does this equation actually like demonstrate in real life right so um yeah so again here's just another chart that you guys can can look at for your own uh, for your own benefit um I will demonstrate charts on the final and midterm just for you to explain, walk me through, you know, I'd ask like, okay, on the X axis represents this, Y axis represents this, um, you know, and, and just, you know, I, I do it for a reason because when you get into like first upper year classes, you're going to have like um, Z direction, right? You're going to have a third dimension that you're going to have to take into account. So again, keeping a track on all these things is very beneficial right from the start and not missing um not missing a single step is important so so yeah um units or variables okay so this is pretty straightforward but again just a gentle reminder that you know we're going to be dealing with uh units which is essentially like kilograms like centimeters like units think about units as like a unit like you know when you look at a unit like, for example, and I'm not talking about, like, some, like, big sports jock, like, this guy. No, I'm not talking about that, you know, or, like, a big buff guy when you go to the gym, like, yo, or or, or girl, you know, like, like, that's a unit. No, 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 like, when I say unit, I'm talking about, like, like a physical location. Like, like that's never going to change, right? Like, it could if it gets demolished, but I'm just saying hypothetically, like, when you look at a house, like, that's a unit. Like, that's that's a unit. Like, that's not moving or going anywhere. So it's standard, right? Think a unit as standard and variables change. Like variables are something that's always going to be changing. So you're going to denote a variable with that little triangle. And a triangle means change, right? Like you, it's 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 Greek for for change. So um, yeah, so it's Greek for change. Uh, apologies again if, if you hear any background music or whatnot. I'm, um, I kept my window open. So there's a bunch of people walking on the street. Um, Okay, so again, we, we, we covered uh, dimensional analysis a little while ago, and that just basically means a crisscross method. So I provide an example here. You know, I'm more than welcome to look at it, copy down the solution, uh, work work through it, though. Make sure you understand the steps I took. And I apologize, the formatting did get messed up. Um, I was converting from PowerPoint to Google Slides, so um, it's not looking too good, but I'll, I'll fix it for next class, which is Monday. Um, okay. Is that the last slide? Hold on. Oh, okay. It is the last slide. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, and I will check the chat for a second. Let me just see. There's three people. Okay. Green. Okay, great. Um, okay, so Okay, so I'm just going to review basically what we went over today. Um, so, uh, and what, what's required from you guys for next class. Um, so like I said, uh, assignments are bi-weekly. Um, so next first assignment is going to happen on Monday. I'm going to release it at the start of class. And you'll have enough time uh, from that day till Wednesday, end of, end of, end of class to submit. Um, I want... Oh, uh, and then, yes, there is a spreadsheet um, that I, uh, I think I put it on slide, one of the beginning, beginning, beginning slides. Essentially, just write your first and last name. Tell me your hobbies. Tell me what you're interested in. Like, like basically, like an intro. Like, give me a, a short intro, like a couple lines. And then, like, what your general interests lie throughout universe or, like, what you're looking to pursue, right? So, if I, so you know, if I, if I can help, if I can share my network or if I can share anyone you know, that's in my close circle or people, um, you know, that could help you, like, if you're interested in medical school, or if you're interested in, like, 
pharmacology or like anything. Um, you know, my whole objective for these 43 classes is to make you guys not only well prepared for your first year, but so excited that you guys look out into the world and you're like, okay, like this is going to be an important, important time in my life because university is very important. Like, I don't know if your parents probably told you that, but the, the amount of people and connections you're going to make is going to be insane. And if I can help you guys get through physics first year through a breeze, because like you basically followed what we did throughout these 43 classes, then, you know, that's, that's my greatest accomplishment and, and biggest happiness. So, um, so yeah, it, at 609, uh, uh, did you, did you both have any questions for me or did you guys want to ask me anything or any questions about the course or anything we covered today or, Okay. So no, no questions. Okay. I, it's okay. I understand. I was, um, I guess it's okay. It's, um, it's okay. It's, a, it's first class. Um, I appreciate you guys showing up. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so again, if you guys can, uh, remind someone can, can someone remind me what the three tasks are for, um, for next Monday? Or can can you guys write in the chat? Can someone can you guys both write in the chat, please? Yes, uh, submit on time. Uh... Loreen, that is very true. That is very true. I'm again, I'm not a stickler for uh, like, and I guess I can share a personal story because like, but for my first year, I, I got burnt really bad. And um, tell us something. Yes, yes, sir. That's, ex that's exactly right. Yep. Tell us something of ourselves and like hobbies. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's uh, yeah. On my first year, I, I, I was very um I, I learned the hard way just to understand that and it was uh yeah it was uh not a good not a good feeling so uh just yeah please submit on time again if you if there is a reason though because you know unfortunate events do happen and I'm always you know just let me know though let me know don't let me know like you know an hour before these time like, even if you remind me even if you tell me on Wednesday morning I'll be more than happily like I'll be more than happy to not only give you an extension but like understand okay like what's happening like you, again I, i'll drop your lowest three assignments so you guys can if you really stress for time like don't don't stress i'll just be like yeah just don't don't even bother submitting it it's okay okay great 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 okay um, um okay just yeah. one question yeah for the personal like paragraph is this supposed to be due on monday like submit it on monday or can we do it right now and submit it yeah, yeah. If you have time, uh, you can do it right now. Submit it there earlier. If you submit it um, by the end of today or end of today's class, which is seven, uh, you get a free 2% bonus. And I'll add okay. that. I'll make sure to add that. Yeah. Um, do I submit it to Google Classroom or should I just send it to you on email? Uh, submit. I mean, I, I think uh, actually submit it, submit it to my email, submit it to my email. And then I'll okay. I'll upload it to the Google Sheets. Okay, no problem. Awesome. Okay, great. Okay, great. And yeah, uh, I just want to make it clear that yeah, today's the first class, so I'm ending it obviously a little bit earlier. Uh, but typically this is like it won't happen uh, again, uh, mainly because like I I know there's going to be more students that you know join late on next Monday, so they're going to ask so. You know, but I'm happy. I'm really appreciate you guys showed up here today. And, uh, you know, it, it, it tells me a lot from the like it tells like tr trust me. When I tell you guys like to show up is, is worth 50 percent of anything that you ever do in your life. Like you just have to show up like the moment you show up, like you're looking at probably like an, a 90, hundred thousand dollar salary. Like you're looking at all of those options. If you just show up, like if you just show up and, and do the work and put in the effort. 
you know, I think, uh, but our society is getting more and more lazy. So, but and again, that's personal. So, but no, again, I appreciate, appreciate you, uh, Lasser and, um, uh, one second. And yes, sorry, Laureen and Yasser, I appreciate you guys showing up to class today. And um, again, you guys have my contact info, email. Um, and then if you need anything, don't hesitate to give me a shout. Uh, questions, concerns, comments, again, I'm always open to hearing them and uh, I, I openly welcome them. So uh, thank you guys for joining the class. Did you have any other questions or anyone, uh, any guys, any other questions? No? Okay, it's pretty clear. All right. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, have a great day, and um, have a great week. I'll see you guys on Monday. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, guys. Bye.